Welcome back to the Long Story Short Show, and this is our Doom Patrol series where we talk about some of the original stories that are being used in the current Doom Patrol DC app series. This week, we are going to be talking about Danny the Street. So, let's begin. Robot Man and Dr. Calder are currently packing up all the equipment in the Doom Patrol headquarters. They are getting ready for a total move out of wherever they are, and Dr. Calder doesn't really know where they're going next, but he wants to make sure they pack up just in case. Meanwhile, Joshua and Dorothy are still training and honing Dorothy's skills to make her imaginary beliefs tangible. For those who have not gotten a chance to read the book yet, Dorothy has been around in Doom Patrol's history for a long time. I haven't mentioned her yet because she didn't have many critical roles in the stories that I covered before. However, Joshua's role is much like the TV show where he's overseeing the growth of specific metas within the Doom Patrol. As the day goes on, the team is ordered to have a group therapy session where it shows that Robot Man is still having the hardest time adjusting to his new life. Rebus, or Larry from the show, seems to be the only one okay with their current circumstance. This fact is the exact opposite of Larry Trainer from the TV show, as Larry in the show hates who he is from the inside out. Rebus in the book is part of three spirits inhabiting a body of a hermaphrodite. Apparently, the alien entity fused a man, woman, and themselves into one being, and that being is now named Rebus. However, this doesn't mean that the costume couldn't use a little spicing up. So, Crazy Jane helps him by painting some distinct tattoos on his bandages. Robot Man stumbles upon them and sees Crazy Jane's dream machine, a machine that makes, um, made out of simple materials, I'm sorry, that will give hallucinations to anyone who focuses on it and closes their eyes. Except for Robot Man, he can't close his eyes. Next, we meet a man named Darren Jones and his wife. Mr. Jones wants nothing more than a normal life that is similar to a 1950s TV sitcom, complete with a white picket fence around their house and a laugh track button for his witty one-liners. As he enters the house, his wife forgets to press the laugh track button and is forced to do the scene again. Luckily for her, she got a mulligan on this one. What she was not prepared for was the fact that Darren's boss, whomever that may be, is joining them from dinner. As Darren puts it, this dinner is all that is standing in between him and a promotion. She had prepared a meal of his favorite, skinless stew, but Darren reprimands her for never listening to him and states that his boss is allergic to skinless stew. He quickly grabs a large fork from the dishes near the sink and he uses it to gouge out his wife's eyes. After. Darren travels into the basement to meet his self-created homunculi, the men from nowhere. I'm not going to describe what these guys look like, so here's a picture. You can check out these weirdos for yourself. What is more important than their looks is how they speak. Every first letter of every word of every sentence they utter spells out nowhere. And as Darren puts it to his homunculi, they are on a war against all freaks and oddities of this world. And the first one on the docket is Danny the Street, a sentient street that can teleport itself anywhere at any time. His reason for taking the street down first is that Danny has lined its streets up with macho stores like gun stores and sports stores, but now what is not acceptable in Danny's eyes is that these same stores are lined with fairy lights and lace curtains. He says the street is a shameless transvestive and that it is an abomination that should not be allowed to threaten normal C any longer. Just so everyone knows, the story was written in the 80s. Just saying. So where is Danny the Street right now? Well, Danny has appeared on the property of a woman named Sarah. He has appeared and reappeared on her property since as long as she can remember. She greets Danny stating that she has missed him and questions him as where he has been this time. Danny says that he was in Birmingham, Alabama, and he had a great time in Birmingham. He even picked up some new friends, like a blonde man named Eddie, who believes that this street is a legitimate paradise. As they walk and talk together, they stumble upon Peeping Tom's Cabaret. As they enter and watch the upcoming show, there is only one seat available. Eddie generously gives it to Sarah and returns outside to continue enjoying the other offerings of Danny the Street. As Sarah shuffles to the free seat, she passes a burly man with curly brown hair. This man will be important coming up, but in the moment, all he does is mumble under his breath. As the show starts, it is very similar to the TV show, where a number of cross-dressers come out, sing, dance, and entertain the crowd. 
Unfortunately, as the show starts picking up pace, an elderly woman calls out that someone has shot and killed Danny. As Sarah rushes to the front of the cabaret, she is met with the men from nowhere who are speaking in the weird pattern that they do. Initially, Sarah does not notice this oddity and screams that the the oh, screams out, I'm sorry, demanding that they remove themselves from her property. They refuse and they open fire on Sarah using their invisible or imaginary guns. You choose. Quickly thinking on her feet, she dives to the side out of the range of the bullets. Unfortunately, the old lady that was standing there does not get away so easily. She is shot point blank and flies back through the cabaret window, breaking it and shattering the glass everywhere. After this, the homunculi turn their specific brand of terror to the rest of Danny Street. As the Doom Patrol arrive on the scene, all hell breaks loose. The street is on fire, buildings are damaged and destroyed, and the sidewalk and street are littered with corpses of people. Sarah pleads to the Doom Patrol to help, and they oblige. At the same time, the grizzled man with brown hair witnesses another death inside the cabaret. The woman ran in screaming that the men from nowhere are attacking everything and everyone. The man states, not again, and the name of a woman, Dolores. He has obviously met these empty men before. This is enough to motivate him to get on his feet. As he rushes outside, he is met with one of the men from nowhere and Crazy Jane. Initially, he warns her not to look into the tear in the homunculi's sleeve. That is a portal to a place called the Tear Room of Despair. Jane is immediately sucked into the sleeve where she is momentarily trapped. When I say momentarily, I mean like 30 seconds because the Sin Eater personality takes over and destroys the room and the homunculi from the inside out. However, when she gets back to reality, the brown haired man is nowhere to be found. Sarah states that the man most likely went back into the cabaret, but before she could finish her sentence, she is shot in the back. Danny the street freaks out and calls out her name using smoke from the sewers and teleports itself and anyone on the street somewhere where he, the street, thinks that they will be safe. Meanwhile, back at the Jones residence, Darren's wife kept running into walls and doors since she had her eyes forcibly removed. So Darren, out of the goodness of his heart, gives her some googly eyes to help her see. They don't work and they look ridiculous. Anyway. Darren is currently making another delirium box. The way he puts it, his last delirium box wore out by gestating the men from nowhere. He says that next time, he'll call on some professionals to do the work. As he finishes up the box, he rushes towards the front door, while at the same time smacking his wife's face saying, don't look at the box. She states that she can even look at it if she wanted to, and she begins to tell him that she's been noticing the neighbors more and more concerned with their little family. She talks it up to the Joneses being a little quirky themselves, and Darren berates her comment saying that she's dumb for thinking that. As a matter of fact, he thought he told her to stop thinking altogether. They are the normal ones. They are the decent Americans. As soon as this whole Danny the Street mess is figured out, he will dose her with another batch of love words. And as if some sort of gift from God, as Darren looks outside, he notices that Danny the Street has been delivered to his front door. Darren states in an old sitcom fashion, well, there goes the neighborhood, when Danny the Street breaks some of the window panes from its buildings and sends shards of glass flying towards Darren. Darren now has shards embedded in his whole body up to his face, and when he looks up, he sees Robot Man, Rebus, and Crazy Jane looking right back down at him. He instantly curses these people for the sake of their quirks and bestows upon them the delirium box. As everyone starts hallucinating, Robot Man is left wondering what the hell this box is supposed to do. Remember, if the person never closes their eyes, the delirium box is rendered inert. At least, that was the thought. After some prolonged exposure, even Robot Man is starting to feel the effect. That is when Danny the Street hops into action. He opens a hole in the ground under Darren, and Darren is transported to the basement of the cabaret, where he is met with the showman from earlier and a tailor. Lingerie and makeup and a wig are forcibly put on his person, and he is transported once again to the basement of his house. Unfortunately, timing is not on his side. As he comes to grips with the events that happen, his wife shows up with his boss that he wasn't expect or that he was expecting earlier that night, Mr. Femister Spine. And he states in classic sitcom fashion once again that he can explain everything. 
Back on Danny the street, everyone is gathering themselves after the hallucinations when Sarah asks Danny what happened to Mr. Jones. Danny's response is that he was fired. However, this story isn't over. We have an incoming alien evasion, reawakening of Rhea Jones, and a new hero on our side. The disheveled man with brown hair stands up and states that he remembers everything. He is Flex Mentallo, man of muscle mystery. So yeah, that's part one of volume three of Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol run. And I just want to say we're picking up some speed, y'all. Uh, the next part of this volume is going to get pretty crazy. If you're a fan of Ray Jones, someone that can tamper with magnetic fields, uh, I would just want to say wait till the next video because she's coming back with a vengeance. Again, thank you everybody for watching and I'll catch you next time.